Welcome to this edition of Peak, Peak Performers, Performers Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performers Podcast. I'm your host, Thor Conklin, and today you are going to enjoy the show. You ever hear of that company out there, Airbnb? Well, I've got someone who plays in that space, and you are going to love this guy. Andrew McConnell is the founder and CEO of Rentit.com, the largest marketplace in the world bringing security to short-term rental income. With an expansive network and the ability to guarantee rental income, Rental.com facilitates a relaxed short-term rental experience for second homeowners. Se- second home. For second home. How, second se- home owners. People that, own, yeah. people that own a second home. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, second home, investment property, you know, vacation home, all of that. Excellent. And also uh, with the managers, you also help them as well. Exactly. So the, we're two sides. We work with the local management companies to the ones that are actually the best to prove they're the best. So instead of going out like every other company in their market and saying, trust me, I'm the best, I'll charge you 25% commission, we let them say, or if you want, I can tell you exactly what I'm going to pay you every single month. And so that owner has a professional manager, has a guaranteed income and can just not have to deal with any of the hassle or worries. Uh, And then that manager now has a new home that they get to manage. All right. And we're going to dive into that in a second, but I didn't finish your bio yet because unlike a lot of guests here, you got some impressive shit here. Andrew holds a degree from Harvard, Harvard Law, Cambridge. What happened to, uh, what's the other one over there? Oxford? Yeah, Oxford. What, ha- what happened? They didn't uh, invite you in or you didn't have enough time to uh, get a third or eighth? I, w- I just wanted to go to the best school on each continent. All so right. I, didn't, all I right. never wanted to do the second best. I just wanted to do the best. The, the, there, there you go. Worked for uh, McKinsey. Um, Matt. Your, your background is, is unbelievable. I am so impressed with you as an entrepreneur. I am honored to have you as my co-chair in the mentorship program and entrepreneurs organization. One badass entrepreneur, kicking ass. And uh, your website, rentit.com. I mean, did you buy that when you were like eight? <laughs> no, we bought it. We started the, the business as vacationfutures.com. And the idea was you have oil futures, you have corn futures. Could I create a new asset class? It's futures on rental rates. And so I bought rentfutures.com and vacationfutures.com and started in the vacation rental market because it was the math worked better. It was growing fast, Airbnb, VRBO, give it a lot of attention. And then, yeah. No, go ahead. Then like a a year or two in, we saw that 30% plus of the customers and the people coming in were not in vacation rental markets. They were because of Airbnb in New York and Boston and LA and these urban markets. And so said, okay, do we, do we now go ahead and flip to rentfutures.com? Now we're we're out of just this vacation thing. I don't want people to pigeonhole us. And the, the thought was, well, actually the last year or two, we've seen the futures part. There's some hedge fund traders in New York with houses in the Hamptons that immediately get it. And everybody else thinks we're a timeshare and has no clue what's going on. And so that's not actually a helpful piece. So we started looking at different names and uh, came up with 650 different ones. But my co-founder, guy who joined me like six months into starting the company, texted me the day we said we were going to change the name and said, hey, rented.com is available. And it took me two months to get there, but eventually we said, okay, let's go get it. And so we bought rented.com. Very, now, it was available, but it wasn't available for $11.99. Yeah, it was not a $9.99. You know, right. it's, uh, vacation Somebody was selling it. It's definitely cheaper than rent. All right. But, you know, it's, there are people that pay six figures and stuff for the websites. We didn't do that. It wasn't like crazy. We went through a broker, so we hid that it was a yeah. business and all that. But, yeah. that, that that's awesome. So, man, t- tell us exactly what it is. You've explained it to me several times. I understand about that much of it. I'm sure it's a lot simpler the audience is a lot smarter than I am. So let's figure this out. What, what do you do? Where, where, where is the business model? The business model is the vast majority of people that have these homes don't want to go spend the 10 hours a week that it takes to rent on Airbnb or VRBO themselves. So on their own marketing, 
materials, VRBO says, hey, it's only going to take you 10 hours a week to manage your home. And as you can probably imagine, the kind of human that can afford an extra house, not just the first house, but an extra house, a vacation home, is not the kind of person that their time's not valuable. You know, they have valuable time. They, they don't want to spend 10 hours a week dealing with complaints and scrubbing toilets or whatever it is. So they look for these management companies. And there are tons of these management companies out there, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, but they all work on a commission. So for a homeowner who's going to try to pick a manager, it's virtually impossible to know, am I getting a good manager? Am I getting a bad manager? Are they going to take care of my home? Are they going to return as much money as they can and should be returning to me? And so because we work on six continents, because we work with thousands of managers all over the world, we know for each market and each property type who the best manager for that home is. And so we take the guesswork out of it and say, homeowner, so you don't have to guess. Here's exactly what you're going to get for the next 24 or 36 months, every single month. Whether it rents or not, we, rented.com, are paying you this exact amount every single month. And we are going to take all the risks because we know the manager and we're going to work with them to make sure that we make enough to cover our cost of capital plus what we're paying you. So you're just doing like an arbitrage between... Exactly. You, we arbitrage. We buy long term and then we rent it short term. Interesting. So if you have some sort of global downturn or something, your, your risk could be huge. How do you uh, mitigate that risk? Yeah, it's... Obviously, it's going to be different the next time around. But the interesting thing about our space is if you look at 08, 09, and forward, that's when the space took off. Occupancy rates went up. 80 uh, average daily rates went down a little bit, but occupancy went up because people don't stop traveling in a downturn. They just don't fly to Hawaii. They drive to Destin. Yeah. They don't fly to Bali. They drive to Hilton Head. And that's why we're very deliberately focused on this globally balanced portfolio in more drive to markets where in a downturn, the data shows they actually perform incredibly well yeah. because you still want to take your family on that summer vacation. You just have to do it more economically. So you're not getting two hotel rooms or three hotel rooms and trying to keep everybody. You're getting one house for the price. Yeah. You know, I just, I got back from my 10th wedding anniversary with my wife and we had, we brought our daughter along. We brought my in-laws and we we're in Italy and each place, we went to Bologna, Florence, Rome, we would get dead center on the Trevi Fountain, on the Ponte Vecchio, penthouse, three-bedroom, huge apartments that had perfect for all of us for the same price as a good hotel, right? And we would have had to have two to three hotel rooms to, to get that kind of space. So it just, and that's an up economy when people are more flush and, and willing to spend. In a down economy, they actually go more to vacation rentals and these alternative accommodations like Airbnb. Yeah, I heard, heard an earful from my uh, forum mates after going to Lisbon. They're like, why didn't you reach out to uh, Andrew to fi figure out a, a nice luxury uh, suite we could find here in Lisbon? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's what he And does. we have like 20-something homes. I know, there. Exactly. I'm staying in one in December. I, 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 look, they, <laughs> they forever banned me from being responsible for the, the accommodations from now on. So. Thank you for getting me out of that. I never had to be responsible. Yeah, exactly. That's you do you do something poorly once and that's don't right. I messed it up. It's like I'll never be asked to do that one again. Yeah. So, how long do you guarantee? You know, you go to the homeowner and say, "All right, is it a year? Is it a five year contract? How long is it?" The average is twenty four months. We we love it longer. We'd love to go up to sixty, but the average is right at twenty four months. And you're paying them out monthly, monthly weekly, yeah. okay. just like a normal lease. So just like Got you it. put a tenant in, you, yeah. So what you're basically doing is you're getting access to their property for all 30 days of the month? Yeah. You're basically, exactly. you're saying, oh, look, I'm going to take your house for the next 24 months. You can't use it. We're going to rent they it out. If they carve it out on the front end. So okay. if at some place they're like, look, we go these two weeks every uh, year. Or right. we wanna, great. Then I know that. I price that in. I say, okay, I can't give you 50. I can give you 47.5. Right. And then basically you go out and find the short-term tenants to fill that, that property, whether it's through a property manager, Airbnb. Uh, it's only through the manager. So the manager actually yeah. does all the finding the tenants, listing on Airbnb, VRBO, all the sites. So okay. that's a nice thing is we have relative local experience and expertise because of who our team is and the companies that we built. But 
the companies that we work with in each market, they have a hundred or 200 of those kinds of properties and really know that market. So yeah. we work with the best manager to do all that. So when the guy flies in and the airport, he's running late, he doesn't have a key yet. The manager takes care of all that stuff. You know, the toilet's yeah. broken. You don't have to worry about any of that. That's all taken. And then he'll utilize whatever other sites that he wants to, to market the, uh, the yeah, his own website, booking.com, all of them. Got it. Now, do you share any of the revenue between what you're basically renting it for and then subletting it, or are you keeping the entire spread? Does the manager get a piece of that? Yeah, so the manager's on commission, and if they okay. hit our hurdle rate, we bump up their commission to oh, incentivize nice. them to, to do more with our properties than their normal portfolio. Interesting. So if, there's a port, if you own a home out there and you're not going through rented.com, your manager is probably not pushing your property because he's pushing Andrew's. Well, that's how we got it started, honestly. So I was in, uh, I was in Turks and Caicos with some family friends and they all had left managers to go to VRBO themselves because they said, look, I don't think these people care. They're pulling 30 cents of every dollar, right. but they're getting 30 cents care. a dollar on every house. So they don't right. care about if my house books or not. And my response was, but they don't have money. They don't have a business without owners. So why don't the owners team up and make the managers guarantee them what they're going to pay them? And then you know they're really incentivized to fill your right. house. They've already told you what they're giving you. And they looked at me like I was an idiot and said, well, yeah, if there's a way to do that, everybody would be doing that. <laughs> so as soon as you hear everybody say, well, that's a big market share. Is it a big market? So instead of going back to the beach in Turks, I spent the next two days in the hotel room researching the space. And kind of 10 months later, after doing a lot of customer discovery and, and starting to get inbounds for people trying to get me to help them, I said, okay, I'm going to leave my job and go build this thing. Fascinating. What, uh, what are some of the mistakes that you made early on that, you know, you look back now and go, man, that was not cool. Screwed that one up. Yeah, there's a number of mistakes. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sure. I'm much better about myself. myself. See, I always yeah. ask that question and people want to know. I just, I do this just so I feel better about myself. Yeah. I mean, one was we didn't know about vesting and all of that. And so we brought like over a year in a co-founder into the mix that never provided any value whatsoever and money never like contributed anything, but walked away with a chunk of the company. That was really dumb. Um, having totally diluted expectations of what was needed to go to market. So I took you know, a decent amount of my savings, like decently high five figures that I just poured into all this development. I'm going to build this great site. It's going to be require X, Y, and Z. Literally no customer ever saw it. We never shipped the product. That was just money I could have months earlier lit on fire and thrown out the door. Or um, give it to your other partner. Yeah, exactly. Like, here, you take this. The, uh, and then what we learned was what we were solving wasn't a website. It was this pain point. And we were able to solve that pain point early on with cell phones and spreadsheets and email. And I didn't need to spend any money on technology. I could use all the things I had. And then that taught us what's, what's the biggest bottleneck. Oh, it's the biggest bottleneck is them being able to instead of getting multiple emails in the week, see everything all together anytime they want. Okay, well, let's build a site that just has the listings. It has the pictures and the details. Right. So it was months and months after we launched and started having tons of customers that we even had something that owners could use because we would deal with all the manual stuff for the owner because the pain point was always on the manager side. And so having, not taking my assumptions for granted earlier in the process would have saved us a bunch of time and money, uh, who you partner with, super, super important. And probably uh, thinking longer term, you know, I, I'm much better at that now, but everything seemed urgent and the whole thing was gonna blow up and you're working around the clock. And like, you know, I, with McKinsey, I worked in Afghanistan. I, I landed in Kabul and firefights are going on and all this and like, you're wearing bulletproof vests. You're wondering if people will get home safely. When you're working in the vacation rental home market, you know, the, the difference of an hour here or there, it's not quite as important as some of this other stuff. So being able to pull back and get some perspective on, you know, it's important and we'll get it taken care of, but it's, the urgency is slightly different. But, but it's important to get to market, get your product out there. There's nothing that you're doing that is proprietary that someone can't come in after you and try to duplicate. So, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs feel that same pressure. It's like, look, I've got to get out there. I've got to make a big splash. I've got to do it quickly. Yep. 
I, I guess that was one learning for me too, though, was yes, people can copy and go do it. Will they once like you're a serial entrepreneur and you know, a lot of serial entrepreneurs yeah. when people know what it goes into actually starting something. Yeah. The, the willingness of people to say, you know what, I'm actually going to put my entire life on hold to go copy this thing that this person's really excited about. Very low likelihood. Yeah. Uh, and so you have a, what I found in my area, we had a lot more time than we thought. Yeah. We're, I'm six years in. I, I got LinkedIn told me I've been doing this for six years and we still don't have anybody doing what yeah. we're doing. Yeah. And so we, we had a lot more time. I was like, oh, we only have three weeks. We got to get this done. But someone could have. They could have. They could have. But they probably would have quit a lot earlier because only someone stupid or insane would have stayed doing what we did for as long as we did. Yeah. You know, it always comes down to the execution. You know, the, the idea is important, but you, know, you can take just about any, any idea. I mean, think about it. What's the most successful restaurant in the world? If, if it's number of locations, it's Subway, right? Subway has the well, most. Or, or, or volume or, or profits. Profits. I mean, what, McDonald's. Well, let's, uh, let, uh, McDonald's, right? Yeah. All right, so McDonald's. They have the shittiest food. If you eat enough of it, it'll actually kill you. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. You yeah. know, it's like, you don't have to have a great product to be a winner in the profitability area. Well, it's knowing what problem you're solving, right? right. They're, they're, they're not solving the delicious. No, no, but do they execute? Hell yeah. Consistent. I know if I'm walking into absolutely you know, somewhere in Estonia and getting a big Mac, it's going to look and taste like the big Mac absolutely. I'm getting in Atlanta. Absolutely. You know, that, and that's the key. It's about the execution. They've got it dialed in. Every single yeah. thing on that line looks the same no matter what McDonald's you walk into. Everybody knows how to execute uh, their particular job, their task. So, yeah, it all, it all comes down, down to that. Yeah, it was, uh, I talked to a friend that said, uh, you know, I had the idea for Airbnb. I had Airbnb years before Airbnb. Like, well, you didn't really. Like, you may have had an idea that was a similar business model, but you didn't have Airbnb because – Someone else went and built it and now has the, you know, $60 billion company or whatever. Yeah. Well, now you got your $60 billion, you know, bolt-on company here. Yeah, exactly. Just attach it to the side. What, what, look, I mean, could it be purchased by Airbnb? People always ask that. I, I don't know. Um, it's, we went into this space looking much bigger than just the short-term rental market. I mean, I, it really is this principled belief of we don't need more things. We, there are plenty of things in the world. There are plenty of, we don't need to build a new hotel. There are five new, perfectly fine, empty houses in that place that you're going to look for a hotel that are available right. that you can stay in. And the reason that we end up getting more and more things is because accessing the excess capacity elsewhere is so difficult. And so what rentit.com is trying to do is securitize rentable assets, saying if we can securitize it and get it out of the hands of the people that own the assets and let people who do this for a living actually churn that back into the market, then it's not just in the $200 billion short-term rental space. You start looking at the $217 trillion real estate space. You start looking at container shipping and airplanes and any kind of rentable asset you could do this for. And so I don't know. We, we think on a different time horizon than like the, the immediate today short-term rental side, I guess. So you got to sell it to Amazon because they're the only ones who are going to Because they're the only company that's going to do it for 20 years anyway. Yeah. We'll go to HQ 54 Atlanta. Any company can divide it in half, sell half to Amazon, half to Google since they're going to yeah. be controlling the world. Yeah. Save a third for uh, Apple, maybe. <laughs> we don't do hardware. I don't think we'd be interesting to Apple yet. <laughs> it all depends what the profitability is. Yeah. What, uh, where do you see this going, this rentable asset class going? You know, we're starting to see it in boats. Hey, mm -hmm. no reason I have a boat. Just go out and rent somebody else's boat. Um, <laughs> they're doing it with, you know, kind of connected you know they're, they're doing uh couch surfing i got friends that you know i guess that's a free model but um that existed before airbnb it was just non-monetized airbnb, airbnb. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um we're doing it with planes with the um um shares of of the uh the plane. yeah like the net jets and, the net jets and stuff and that's yeah. been around for a while um 
we're starting to see it with individual cars where people are renting out their individual cars. Get around and yeah. Turo. What's yeah. that? What it gets down to is you can get as small or as big as you want. So container ships, uh, you could do entire office buildings. And what you do is you separate. So you think about boom and bust of real estate. And it's because it's always debt fueled. So I go line up all this debt and I'm going to have to service it, et cetera. But why could you not fund the building of it by selling the future rental rights to that asset? And so you separate, you don't need debt to fuel anymore. You have the rental rights. Somebody else has already done that, securitized it, packaged it, diversified it, and then they can rent it out on the short-term rental market. So you sell at a discount on the front end your future rental rights, just like it's why people sell futures in corn. I don't know exactly how next year's corn market is going to be, but if I can go ahead and sell at a discount to what it may have been today, then as a farmer, I know I'm going to eat next year and I know I'm going to be able to, to buy the grain, et cetera. And if people do it from enough geographies and everything, pull it all together, they say we can balance the risk. No one farmer can balance that risk, right. but if we pull it all together, we can do it. And so, you know, I, I don't think there's really a limit. There may be assets that get way too small. Like you're not running out your toothbrush. Your toothbrush is sitting there 99.9% .9 of the day, not being used, but there's very low likelihood that's an asset that's going to get rented out. Um, sure. So there, there are still assets that it makes sense now, to not share. You know, now I've got a nice <laughs> pen here. I'll raise yeah. pen yeah. if anybody wants it. Yeah. No? Um, but I mean, like you already even see it with computers that not – for the actual operating system, but for the computing power, yeah, that's companies true. like storage for the space or people yeah, for yeah. to create these supercomputer networks that, hey, you're not using it at night when you're sleeping. Maybe if you put it in this network, I can give you some, there's crypto on top, there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. But, so go back to the, uh, the commercial real estate because I, I missed how that would be applicable. So you're saying instead of, in order to fund a future project or you don't need any future projects, for, Bring me back. Rewind. Yeah, so there's different. So I, there's a fundamentally, I'm not sure how many more hotels we need in the world, right? right? Like there's I plenty the, of- I got the hotel piece. I was yeah. talking about the commercial real estate office space. Yeah, commercial real estate saying, hey, instead of me going and levering this up, lining up the debt, putting however many hundreds yep. of millions, depending on the project, in debt, what I'm going to do is I'm going to package these rental rates. I'm going to sell the next- Two years is one tranche. I'll sell years three to so who? is another. This is where once you get big enough, this is why it, it's yeah, like yeah. a multi-decade time. Are you, are you talking about? It's hedge funds. Oh, it's hedge funds, Wall bank. Street. Okay. It's, it's yeah. Investment. Wall Street. Yeah. They, it's what they did with mortgages, et cetera. Got it. So, yeah. so you're taking, you're saying, okay, you buy this on a future basis. I'll take that investment. I'll use that investment to actually build it. They'll then end up getting the rental whatever it is at the time, or actually just, are you going to be trading these contracts? Well, the, the tr contracts would have to be tradable. You know, you'd have to have, um, Some they'd sort of either, market. yeah, you want a liquid market and then you could hire the manager or actually spot trade it yourself, which is essentially what the lease would be, would be the spot trade. And depending how the economy is doing and how it's leasing up, then how the performance on year one or year two is, is going to influence what the value of that future for year five or year 10 is, right? Like you can influence yeah. the future based on today's market. Um, and then the people developing, you know, you, you may get origination fees essentially for, okay, okay I'm about this project. And that's, that's where I'm pulling my piece out. Yeah. Now, do you think that would lead to um, overdevelopment? Because here it is. I, I, I think I'll, I'll just less, I'm not thinking, people I don't wouldn't buy the futures, right? People wouldn't, somebody's taking the risk. So if you go say, hey, I want to go do it, like yeah. there could be a short-term bump of like ICO market where anybody's throwing money in. And so yeah. people say, oh, futures, they're always going to be worth more. Well, we know that's not true. You know, right. oil went from 100 down to 40. Right. Like you could definitely lose money in that. Um, and so that is a risk. But if it is sophisticated financial players that are underwriting it and pricing it, then once you start saturating a market, you say, no, the, the 20 year future on this is worth zero. You have no value in this. It's a well, well, Wall, Street will, uh, Wall Street will take it, securitize it after that, and then sell it to mainstream. Repackage, repackage, repackage. <laughs> sell it to the government. Yeah.
<laughs> That's right. They'll, they'll, they'll just backstop it. Yeah. It, you've worked with some really, really smart people over the years working uh, in McKinsey. What do you see as some of the smartest people that you admire in business? What are some of the things, what are some of the belief systems, what are some of the, the psychology or their uh, habits that they do that really just make them stand out from the rest? One is listening. So there, there's this one VC that every single person I've ever talked to who knows the person said, he's the smartest person I've ever met. And he talks the least of anyone you'll ever meet. But when he speaks, everyone in the entire room just goes quiet because they know whatever's coming out is just absolute gold. Um, I have this separate thing question of, does that make it mean that he just speaks less and less over time? Because the bar gets so high, he's terrified of what he might say. But that's speak less when you speak, make it mean more. Uh, certainly one. The other is this specialization. You know, I, I had two mentors I stay in touch with at McKinsey that were very, very senior partners. One's now a governor of the Federal Reserve, another's on several public company boards. And they could not be more different. You know, they started at similar times, they worked on the same teams, they both ran McKinsey at, at kind of a global level, but just so different in how they created value, how they delivered value, how they mentored people. And it wasn't this belief of there's one cookie cutter approach to success and I need to fit this mold, but it was this embrace your strengths and just push those to the absolute limits where I'm going to be the best of anyone in the world at this thing. And it's a super narrow thing, but I'm going to be so good at it. It's going to make a huge, huge impact. And I, I think that um, these two guys, Tom Barkin and, and Rob Yanker at McKinsey, really saw that in the juxtaposition of them. Yeah, I spent the first uh, 15 years of my career in the insurance business. Uh, towards the end, we started, uh, I was in a specialized group that uh, helped private equity firms uh, enter and exit deals. And I remember as a young college student, uh, co-op student initially, is going into a large brokerage firm and seeing all the different players. And it became very apparent very early on that there were some specialists and these specialists were absolutely killing it. Um, yeah. And in the insurance world, one was, um, it wasn't, uh, it was maritime. Uh, okay. These guys were doing large shipping companies, you know, okay. obviously the container ships, uh, insuring them around the world, and then also aviation. So you had high value assets um, being ever flown or, or, or floated somewhere, and they just, they controlled that market. They knew everybody in that space. It was a small space and they were deemed the guy. Uh, and people to today ask me all the time, you know, if you were getting in the insurance business or, or any business for that matter, you know, what would you do? It's like pick a niche, yeah, figure that out, go deep and stop trying to concentrate on shoring up your weaknesses. Just you're going to have them. There's a gr great book. I think it was called Eagle School. And it, okay. it's almost like a, yeah, it's almost like a children's book. I think it's called Eagle School. And it's a story about these animals that go to school. It was, there was a turtle, there was a frog, there was an eagle, there was a couple of different ones. And of course, the first day of school, they were trying to teach the, um, the turtle was, was in the swim class and then like the, um, the elephant and the, the bird and the lizard, you know, they were trying to do the, the swim portion it's yeah. like they were good swimmers and of course the chimpanzee was great at the swinging and basically if you know if you're an eagle learn to be the best flyer if you're yeah. a fit, learn to be the best swimmer um and actually speaking of swimming you actually helped me uh, get through my iron man so i appreciate that you were a collegiate uh, swimmer i was uh i swam for harvard and then the u.s national team uh, oh and the u.s national team just Throw that one on top. I, I love that. When it comes to athletics, what – you know I love busting your balls and yeah. being great. I, I, I admire what you accomplish. Um, in athletics, what separates the best from the rest? 
A lot of people aren't going to love this answer, but I think th- hey, there's come a... Come on, man. Give us the truth. <laughs> there's a big portion now. It's this nature versus nurture side, and I think it's 50-50. There's, genetics is a very big contributor. Like, I'm not going to be LeBron James. You know, okay. being, having the frame, being 6'8", you're going to get to a certain level. So that's, that's one piece. But the same side... Muggsy Bogues made it to the NBA and Spud Webb made it to the NBA. So there's, if you do it back to that niche, like know what you're going to do. And this is the second part. You have to work just so hard. I mean, like the genetics will only get you so far. I saw, I went to high school with at a place that in the 96 Olympics, we had 19 swimming Olympians, multiple gold medalists, multiple world record holders from my high school. And this was wow. a high school that graduated each year about 170 people. That's in, you know, from Which all, high school. It was called the Bowl School in Jacksonville. I went for the last year and a half to, okay. to focus on swimming. Did, did they actually recruit swimmers from around the country to, to go to that school? Is that what it was the known? Schools knew, they didn't recruit me, but I had known, you know, within the swimming circle, my coach yeah. left. I needed to find a place. I'm like, oh, there, there's this place. And then they had a partnership with the International Olympic Committee. So we also had Olympians from all over the world that would come there. Got it. And the amount we would work versus anybody else in high school, you know, it's, you're doing five mornings a week, you're doing six afternoons a week, you're hours and hours going into it that I saw people with the most talent and the number of people that actually made it through swimming all four years of college was probably less than 50% because you got to this level where the commitment it took to compete at that level, people just didn't want to do it anymore. They just couldn't do it anymore. And that's why I think about Michael Phelps, best swimmer that's ever lived. He retired like twice, right? The guy quit twice. I'm not doing this anymore. And then he comes back, but it's, he knows that if I just keep doing this thing, if I just am willing to work this hard, no one can catch me. I'm the best, but it's, it's mentally and physically draining. And so, committing and grinding it out is 90% of the battle. You know, when I, I was on the national team, the reason I was is both grinding and niche, right? I looked at it and I was like, look, I may be top 20 in the country in this pool stuff, but there are these other things that are far less competitive. Like how many people are willing to sign up and say, raise your hand, I'm going to go do a 25K. Like, well, it's a pretty small group. I like my chances of going and winning that. Yeah. So I go do that, make the national team, go get third in the world. Not because, you know, now open water is an Olympic sport. Back then it wasn't. So it was, I would go to world champs, but I couldn't go to the Olympics. So less people were focused on it. And so finding that area to work so much harder than anybody else. I was like, look, that's what my coach said. Every time I, before I get on the blocks, he's like, look, when you start feeling in pain or somebody's coming up on you, just know you worked harder than all of them. Yeah. So you're going to win. And that, that for me was a, a big competitive. And that's, uh, you know, Kobe, all these people say the same thing. It's like, look, when it comes and I'm doing head to head, I know I worked harder than you. Yeah. I'm going to have this level of confidence that you're just, you're going to start questioning. You're going to question every decision you made that got you here. Cause I worked harder than you. And yeah, you're going to the results now. You know, I did a podcast just uh, recently. I was talking about, you know, in today's environment and, you hear an awful lot about, hey, it's all about the why, all about the why, all about the why. And there's this talk about the big why. And I realized when I was doing the Ironman, you know, I was, I don't know, in hour 12, 13, who knows? Well, <laughs> it was 16 and a half hours. But my feet were just torn apart, blisters everywhere. It oh. was a torrential downpour. I mean, it just sucked. And I remember just stacking the whys. My coach is here. I said I would. People are counting on me. I'm an example for what's possible. And I realized when I was done, if I just had one why, it was probably easier to undermine that one thing. But as I started to stack Stack. the multiple whys and uh, weave them into a a stronger rope or a a cable, it it just became non-negotiable. It was just, I'm just, it will not happen. I am going to keep going. If I lose a leg, you know, I'm going to hop over the, 
I didn't get to the end. I could practically swim based on the amount of water that was on the. I saw that video. It was insane. I, was oh, like, yeah. I mean, just the splashing. And, good lord. And I, and I had my feet were so torn up that as the water started to recede and my shoes started to dry out, my feet started hurting more. So I was running around finding the puddles just to to cool my. You dampen. Feet. Oh, geez. Yeah, it, it's, that's uh, that's that's pretty sad when you do that, but. You know, you, you talk about this grit and, and this, you know, pushing through and grinding it out. And here's something that I found, and it was interesting because I thought it would go away. I, I trained for a year to, to get this done. And whether it was the swim portion or the bike portion or the run portion, it didn't matter. Early in those disciplines, there comes a time that you're just, you're tired. You're, I'm swimming and it's maybe it's a mile into the swim and I'm tired and it's like, I remember this during training and I'm like, when am I going to get to the point where it just doesn't hurt anymore or it's, I'm not tired anymore when, on a bike, when can I do that first hour and a half and not be a little winded? And what I found was, and, and again, maybe I just didn't train hard enough, but what I found was it never went away. There was this point in each of the disciplines that you got tired, you got winded, and then all you needed to do was push through that. And then the rest of the six, you know, if I was on a bike, the, re the next six hours flew by and was in perfect harmony and cadence where I wasn't losing my breath. It wasn't painful. Did you find that as well as a swimmer? It, was there a point, you know, they talk about with, with uh, runners that you hit the, hit the wall that generally comes later in the, in the race. Uh, so my question is, did I not train hard enough or is that something that you see all the time? Because I think in business, it's the same way. It's, it's, I think there's a point that we work and most hit this point and then stop or quit. And it's just, you just got to get past that one bit and then it's almost like downhill from that point. Yeah, I, I'd so say that's there's a long question. There are kind of two components of it. I think one is you get, better at the pacing and knowing what you can do. Uh, like the first time I did a 10K, I was like, well, this is a lot shorter than a 25K. I can just sprint it. And so at the first buoy a quarter of the way in, I was three and a half minutes ahead on the next closest person. And they're like, oh my God, what's going on? And then I just totally hit a wall and got 12th or something. You know, I just got totally wrecked and almost died. Um, super dehydrated, like dangerous. Uh, that that was I didn't have good pacing. Like I, you get smarter about that. The the other piece of it is the human body is so much more capable than we realize, and the human mind is so much more capable than we realize. And so you hear these feats of like the pregnant lady that her husband's trapped under a car and she just picks up the car and saves his life. And like that's a thing a human body can do, but we we're so programmed to think of what our limits are that we think we should be tired, we are tired, but compared to what the body can do, you just push through and say, oh, no, like, I'm, I'm better than that. I actually am better than my body was telling me I am. I can get further than this. And so I think there's a, a, a level of that too. Once you push through it, it reframes your mind of, oh, no, I'm more capable than my body. My body was just trying yeah. to trick me. My body was tired, but my mind struggled with my body, and my mind's going to push my body through this. Yeah, it almost seems like it's a um, a little bit of a, a war between you know one part of your body saying, "Okay, look, you know, s calm down. This is a little much." And then as long as you just sit there and go, "No, we're going through this," it, it kind of like resets. It gets on. Yeah, it's like all right, all right, okay. So I, I get it. You so win. <laughs> we're going to be working a lot today, aren't we? It's like all right, so yeah. we went to a different uh, mode. Yeah, it, it's been, it was fascinating, and the cool part, and this is why we we talk a lot about physical uh, fitness here and how important it is in business as well, because everything that you learn on the field and everything that you train your body and your mind to do is completely uh, cross-textual and can be used in business or any area of your life. Yeah. I mean, that's why you see so many of these top people, like the guy who runs the Falcons, uh, and I think all Arthur's blank stuff. I was just at an event with him last week. He was number one in his class at West Point physically. Like, I guess that's the thing that they rank. And he was number one. And, you know, it's, you see these people. And the guy who was hosting the event that's the CEO of this thing, he was number one. He was valedictorian of his class. 
and a Black Hawk helicopter pilot and all that. And like people that are excellent carry that excellence over. Yeah. And so pushing yourself to excellence in one field, it, it's gonna, you can't help but let it bleed into other areas. Yeah. And, you know, I um, knew on the triathlon that it was going to take me, well, it had to take me less than 17 hours. So it was going to be I think it's 16, 16 and a half hours. A couple uh, earlier in the season, I did a mountain climb where I did it consistently for 31 straight hours. I was like, all right, I did that for 31 hours. You know, this is going to be 16. It's a, it's a walk in the park. And even though there were completely different disciplines, I'm telling you, it, there, was a, there was a sense of calm that, hey, I already did that. Right. This is not, you know, I've been there, done that. Again, I wasn't riding a bike or swimming or, or running, but it just, I knew that, I knew what I was capable of. Right. What you can push your body to. Yeah. Well, yeah. man, I, we could keep going on and on. I know we got off uh, topic from uh, from business a little bit here, but uh, what you've been able to accomplish uh, so far, um, well done, man. I know this is just the beginning. Um, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I, I I know so. All right, uh, from from my from my lips to uh, God's ears. All right, I, okay. <laughs> I, I I get a chance to work with a lot of entrepreneurs, and there's threads that run between all the ultra successful ones they've chosen models that have tremendous and unlimited upside their discipline in areas of their life is just dialed in uh you're a disciplined smart dude um i'm i'm thrilled to see what's going to come of this um this is just the beginning so I'm, uh, I'm proud to call you a, a friend. Glad to have you on the, the mentoring team and uh, looking forward to see what, uh, what comes of it. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Tell the, uh, tell the audience having in touch with you. The best, I, Twitter, my handle at M Michael at, at M A McConnell, M C C O N N E L L. Uh, and then LinkedIn and just again, forward slash M A McConnell. Terrific. And uh, if you have a second home and you want it uh, taken care of, check out rented.com. Yeah. We're the only product that we, uh, we don't sell. We just pay you money. So it's pretty, pretty convenient. I, I want to have a second home for myself now. <laughs> exactly. All right, man. Have a great day. Thanks. You too, Thor. Thank you. Thanks.